So we left off at the end of the last video, proving that a sub s is compact, where a sub s is the x values for a function with domain interval from a to b, closed and bounded interval from a to b, where the oscillation of f at x is greater than or equal to s. So we know from previous results, uh, these are some of the points at which the function f is discontinuous. Remember the oscillation of f about x equals zero if and only if f is continuous at point x. So these points in a sub s are the points where there's informally there's a gap of size um, at least s in the function. So a discontinuity with informally a gap of size at least s. Now we just showed uh, those are uh, compact sets, closed and bounded sets, since we're dealing with sets of real numbers. Um, from this exercise, if f is discontinuous at some x sub zero in the interval from a to b, then x sub zero is in one of those a sub s's. It's in an a sub s for some s greater than zero because the points of discontinuity are points where the oscillation is positive. So if we have f mapping the closed and bounded interval a, b uh, into the real numbers, the set of discontinuities then is a union from n equals one to infinity of a sub one over n. So a sub one over n would be the set of points where uh, the oscillation is at least one over n. Well, if we'll union all those up from n equals one to infinity, then we've got a collection of sets that will include all points where the oscillation is greater than zero, where the oscillation is positive. And since that would be precisely the collection of points where the function is discontinuous, we can write for such a function that the set of discontinuities can be written in this form. Let's call it set D. And remember, the a sub 1 over n's, those were compact in the previous example. Uh, in particular, they were closed. So for such a function, we've written a set of discontinuities as a countable, countable, by introducing the natural numbers, a countable union of closed sets. Um, is a countable union of closed sets closed? Uh, not necessarily. A countable, actually an arbitrary intersection of closed sets is closed. Unions, a finite union of closed sets is closed. A countable union, infinite, infinite union and countable, maybe not. But it turns out we'll be interested in the structures of sets in terms of countable unions and countable intersections and open and closed sets. Uh, and a set that is a countable union of closed sets, such as this one, will be called later on an F sigma set. One of the first sections we do in uh, the graduate real analysis will address the definition of F sigma sets. Uh, so we see that the set of discontinuities of such a function is an F sigma set, as it, that is, in italics, it's a countable union of closed sets. Can you tell me what a countable union of closed sets looks like? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's a countable union of closed sets. Can you tell me what a countable intersection of closed sets looks like? Yeah, it's closed set. So I can't more directly tell you what a countable union of closed sets look like beyond it's a countable union of closed sets. It's a whole class of sets we will take an interest in called F sigma sets. Uh, and we could show more generally, if we have a function mapping the reals into the reals, then the set of discontinuities is still a, such a set, an F sigma set. So we'll encounter F sigma sets and their complements G delta sets um, early on in our exploration of sets of real numbers. But now we've got the equipment to go through and prove uh, the second half of the riemann lebesgue theorem, part B. Consider a bounded function f defined on the interval a, b. Yet again, no real constraint there other than this is where an exploration of Riemann integration starts. If the set of discontinuities of f has measure zero, then f is Riemann integrable. 
Okay, part A said if F is Riemann integrable, then the set of discontinuities has measure zero. So when we combine that first part with the second part, then we get that a bounded function on a closed and bounded interval is Riemann integrable if and only if the set of discontinuities has measure zero. More of that in a little while. Let's uh, hack our way through the proof of this. Not too bad with the background we now have. Uh, suppose F is bounded on the interval A, B, and let A denote the set of discontinuities, and we have by hypothesis that the measure of the set of discontinuities is zero, so the measure of set A is zero. Let capital M be the soup of the function values over the appropriate uh, input values over the domain of F. Let lowercase m be the infimum of the uh, function values. You said, we hypothesized that F was bounded. Okay, so capital M and lowercase m, they're, they're finite numbers. Uh, so we'll do some computations with them. So we're about to use the hypothesis of boundedness here shortly. Um, we can assume that the soup value is greater than the nth value. If those are equal, we're dealing with a constant function and you know constant functions are continuous and you know constant functions are Riemann integrable. So without loss of generality there, capital M is strictly greater than lowercase m. We're going to do some division by capital M minus lowercase m. So that's why we make that observation. Define A sub S like we did above. The X values in the domain of the function where the oscillation of F about X is greater than or equal to S. Okay, um, do so for S positive, all S positive. Um, these are points where F is discontinuous because the oscillation is not zero. It's strictly greater than zero. Uh, what it is in any particular X value, I can't tell you whether it's, it's at least S. So think of the function as uh, having a gap of size s in it, or I should say at least s, for an x value in this set a sub s. So the function ain't continuous on such x values, that is, a sub s is a subset of a. The points in here are points of discontinuity because the oscillation's not zero. It's at least s, which is strictly positive. So A sub S includes some points of discontinuity. We've hypothesized that the measure of the set of points of discontinuity is zero. This is a subset of um, set A. So the measure of the A sub S is also zero. Uh, I should document it, it was theorem six dash six, I think it was. It said a subset of a set of measure zero is a set of measure zero. This is a subset of a set of measure zero and hence is itself a set of measure zero. Okay. Um, so let epsilon be greater than zero. Then there exists open intervals, I1, I2, and so forth, such that, remember, all these A sub whatevers have measure zero. Let's take A sub, make it bigger briefly. I need kind of a big picture here. So I'll have to shrink it back down, but a sub epsilon over two times b minus a. There's a little positive number. Uh, a sub this s has measure zero. Uh, what does measure zero mean? I can cover it with a countable number of open intervals, the sums of whose measures, the sums of whose lengths. It can be made as small as I like. You give me the small as I like first. I say the small as I like is epsilon over two times capital M minus lowercase m. So this set having measure zero can be covered with a countable number of open, un open intervals, the uh, measure of which, the sums of the measures of which, sums of the lengths of which, length of an open interval is its measure, can be made smaller than this positive number. Okay, so we take epsilon over two capital M minus lowercase m here, that's definitely positive, and we're considering this thing here. All right, so, what we're gonna do in the big picture in this is we're gonna look at Riemann sums and we're gonna have good things happening on big sets and bad things happening, but happening on little sets. And we'll be able to, in some sense, bound the badness. And that's how the result will come out. You'll see in the computations. Okay, uh, the fact that this set has measure zero, 
allows us to find these I1, I2s, and so forth. We know this set of A sub whatever is compact. A sub S is compact for all S greater than zero by the exercise we just did in the previous video. So there's a finite subcover from this collection of I1, I2s, and so forth. Uh, it's standard maybe just to write it like this. Well, I might have to re-index those intervals so that I get the first one and the second one up to the nth one. Uh, anyhow, re-index is necessary. But an arbitrary collection of a compact set with open sets has a finite subcover using the definition of compact. Like the Heine Burrell stuff, the definition of compact. I'll say the important thing about compact sets isn't that when it's sets of real numbers, they're closed and bounded. It's the definition. It's that every open cover has a finite subcover. And that's what we're using right here. So we can extract this finite subcover of A sub epsilon over 2 B minus A. All right, we're going to have two kind of points those that are in here and those that ain't. If we take an x value in the domain of the function and not in the union of these intervals, by the way, this is a subset of the domain of the function set minus a sub epsilon over 2b minus a. Uh, remember the intervals covered this thing here. Here we're taking the interval from a to b and removing this. These covered this set. So I've removed maybe more here from the interval from a to b than I've removed over here. Uh, follows from this statement right here, in fact. So I get the subset inclusion this way. And I don't know, in some sense, there's like a negative sign there. We're, we're set subtracting. So the subset inclusion allows us, us to send that sense of reversal on the subset inclusion when we do the set subtraction through the little backslash deal. So um, for these x values, we've got points where the oscillation isn't at least um, this quantity here, the, the subscript on that set A. So the oscillation is less than that. The oscillation of F at such an X value is strictly less than epsilon over two, that's B minus A. If it was greater than or equal to that, then that X value would be in this set uh, A sub epsilon over 2 b minus a. Remember what the definition of the a sub whatevers are. The oscillation is at least the whatever, at least that quantity, at least this quantity. So if x is not in there, but it's in the domain of the function, then the oscillation is little. All right, here's what's going to happen. We're going to have that the oscillation is little a lot of the time on a big set. We're going to have that the oscillation is big, at least as big as epsilon over 2b minus a on a big set. So it's a balance of good and evil. It's a balance of small oscillations on big sets and big oscillations on small sets. So welcome to analysis. And I can't get rid of everything, but I can make bad things happen on little sets. So for uh, any x, then uh, there exists uh, delta sub x greater than zero such that if we take x prime and x double prime from the interval x minus delta sub x to x plus delta sub x, then uh, the absolute value of the difference of the function values is less than epsilon over b minus a. Uh, follows from the definition of oscillation uh, when we're taking an x of this sort for any such x, we should say. Since the oscillation is less than epsilon over 2b minus a, then I choose particular values um, in an interval of sufficiently small width. Remember, we did this with a limit as h approaches zero from the positive side. It's that, that limit part that's allowing us to make this claim. Okay, so specific function values less than this quantity here. All right. More about this set. Uh, this is a closed set, and it's a bounded set. It's a subset of the interval a, b. We've taken the interval from a to b, the closed interval from a to b, and we've removed this finite union of open intervals. See, a finite union of open intervals is open. It's an arbitrary union of open sets is open. So anyhow, this is open. So we've taken a closed set, and we've set subtracted uh, an open set. 
uh, set subtraction can be dealt with in terms of intersections with complements. We're effectively intersecting two closed sets in this. Uh, and the intersection of two closed sets is closed. So this set subtraction, this is closed. It's bounded because it's a subset of AB. So Heine Burrell says closed and bounded set of real numbers must be compact. So this thing here is compact. Now, for every X in this set, we just claimed for every such X, an X in, in this set, or this set, I guess, there exists a delta sub X greater than zero such that we had these intervals on which any two elements from those intervals had function values which differed in absolute value less than this amount. So what we're gonna do is for every X like this, we're gonna find one of these little open intervals. For every X in this set, find such a delta sub X. For every X in this set, find such a delta sub X. Find one of those intervals as described above. All right, that's an open cover of this set because every X in this set is in one of these intervals. It's at the center of one of these intervals, in fact. Okay, so that means these collection of intervals, how many of them are there? There's one for every X value in this set. So I suspect there's a, an uncountable number of them. Uh, I might be off on that because we're going to show something as measure zero and that allows for possibility of countable. There, should, there could be a lot of them. Certainly there could be an infinite number of them. But these open intervals are covering this set and we just said, hey, this set's compact. Well, if this set's compact and we've got an open cover of it, there's a finite subcover definition of compact. So we've used Heine Burrell to recognize the compactness and the definition of compactness to do the heavy lifting ultimately. So there's a finite collection of these little intervals that covers this thing. Say x1 bar minus delta one, x1 bar plus delta uh, one and so forth. You know, um, index them as appropriate. I didn't have to worry about indices up here. We've, we've passed to some finite collection, say it's indexed one through k. So these things here cover this. So in the interval from A to B in the domain of the function, we got two kinds of points. Those that are contained in here and those that ain't. Those that ain't must be contained in here. Everything in this is in some little interval of this sort. The things in the domain that aren't in here would have to be inside these little I sub I's, capital I's and lowercase i's, this little finite collection of open intervals. So we can cover the whole thing. We can cover the closed interval from A to B using these open sets along with these I sub I's, I1 through I sub capital N. That's how we denote them. So here's you a finite cover of the interval from A to B. There's two kind of points we're dealing with, those that are in here and those that are in the subscripted I's. Those that are in here have, a, make sure I get it right. Let's see, those that are in there are not in here. They have um, small oscillation, less than epsilon over 2b minus a. So we've got small oscillation on these things and big oscillation on these. I bet these are little though. Remember, we hypothesize that the set of discontinuities has measure zero. What are we trying to show? Uh, trying to show this. Well, we're trying to show Riemann integrability, which is equivalent for a given epsilon of finding a partition that satisfies this highlighted thing. Okay, <clears throat> here comes a partition. Let capital P be uh, x sub zero through uh, x sub j, say, I've already used a parameter k up there for something else, it's a whatever dummy variable. x zero through x sub j, let this be a partition of the interval from a to b such that the x sub i minus one to x sub i's, the sub intervals, are each completely contained in one interval of this cover. So 
Uh, here's the collection of intervals that cover it. I want this partition to be sufficiently fine that every little subinterval is contained in, uh, say, one of these or one of these or one of these. You know what I mean? So the partition is sufficiently fine that the resulting subintervals are contained strictly inside these types of intervals here. These things cover the domain. All we got to do is chop partition P into small enough pieces to get that kind of behavior. We're going to claim, or here's the plan, that partition satisfies this condition. If we'll take an upper Riemann sum minus a lower Riemann sum, we'll get something less than epsilon. Oh, uh, gee, something we haven't used yet, that epsilon over 2, B minus A. Right, this, this came kind of out of the blue, and we haven't used that yet. Arguably, this thing came kind of out of the blue. Um, we haven't really made use of that yet either, but we're about to make use of both of them. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, look at the difference of upper and lower Riemann sums with respect to that partition. That would be a sum of the sort, capital M sub I of F minus lowercase m sub I of F delta X sub I, summed over the whole thing, the whole partition. To be I equals um, 1 to J in the symbols we have here. So when we take a difference of upper minus lower Riemann sum, we'll get something that looks like this, but we're going to break that sum from 1 to J into two kinds. Remember, there's good and evil. We're going to collect the good stuff together in one sum and the evil stuff together in the other sum. Evil is big oscillation. So we're going to partition the subintervals uh, given by this set P into a set C sub 1 of intervals, which are contained in one of the capital I's, and the remaining ones. The remaining ones must be contained in some of the um, X bar minus delta to X bar plus delta type intervals. And what was the story? The oscillation was small in these sets and large in the capital I's. Okay. So take that sum from one to J, break it up into a sum over C sub one and C sub two, uh, which is good and which is evil. C sub one was intervals contained in the uh, capital I's. Yeah, this is the bad ones. This is where the oscillation is big. This is the good ones. This is where the oscillation is small inside those little X bar plus or minus delta type intervals. Okay. Well, let's look at the C sub 1 and see the goodness and the badness. If we'll sum over the, uh, the bad ones, capital M sub I of F minus lowercase m sub I of F, de delta X sub I, how big is the oscillation? Um, how about this? It's less than or equal to capital M minus lowercase m. And that was the soup and the nth for the function. The oscillation couldn't be bigger than that. I mean, this is an upper bound, capital M. Lowercase m is a lower bound on function values. We, we started with a bounded function, and that's what those things are. So the oscillation uh, anywhere in there couldn't be bigger than capital M uh, minus lowercase m. So all of these things here are less than or equal to capital M minus lowercase m. Okay, so replace this stuff based on i's with this constant and bring it outside the sum. Then you're left with a sum of some of the delta x sub i's. Uh, which ones? The, the c sub ones. It was the uh, c sub ones with the intervals contained in some of the uh, capital I things. Well, all these delta x sub i's are contained in some c sub i's. So uh, let's just take a sum over all of the, uh, sorry, containing the capital i's. Let's take a sum over all the capital I's. So this would be the sum of the links of the little subintervals. These are all contained inside uh, capital I sub I. The subintervals are disjoint, by the way, except maybe at endpoints. Um, so we're replacing the sum of these links with the sum of all of the links of the capital I sub I's. Length and measure, same thing for an open interval. That'll hold true when we get into uh, measure theory in general. Well, now, how big was the sum of the links or measures of these capital I sub I's? This is bad stuff, a lot of oscillation. But remember, the 
collection of the eyes, those formed a set of measure zero. Or, well, sorry, those covered a set of measure zero, and we picked them such that the sums of their measures was less than epsilon over two capital M minus lowercase m. Now you see why we put the capital M minus lowercase m stuff there. Ooh, and also, this was an infinite sum, the series. Uh, we've only got a finite number of those. Okay, well, you still got this as an upper bound. And we're about to replace the sum of the measures of those intervals with an epsilon over two. There it is, epsilon over two times capital M minus lowercase m. Why do we do that up there? Oh, I see. So now we can get cancellation here and we get an epsilon over two. So we've got a sum over C sub one, this part of the difference of the Riemann sums to be epsilon over two. That's only half the story. Of course, we'll get the other epsilon over two from the, the C sub two indices. Okay, so this was bad stuff. The oscillation was big, but it happened on a little set because we had chosen those intervals in such a way that we were sure that the sums of their lengths, sums of their measures could be made that small set. Um, we were able to do that because a set of discontinuities has measure zero. So that's how we got this small on that part of the hypothesis. Now we've taken advantage of the fact that uh, in this one, the intervals are small. All right, next, so we still got to deal with the C sub two part. We're going to get another epsilon over two and then problem solved finally. But if uh, sub interval X sub I minus one to X sub I is a subset of, remember these have to be subsets of these type things. If we were dealing with subsets of the capital I's, we took care of it up here. So this must be a subset of one of those things there. What happened on those things there? On uh, those things there, we had an oscillation less than epsilon over two B minus A. They came from A sub epsilon over two B minus A. So if we choose any two points in this sub interval, then the difference of the function values and absolute value can be at most this. It's bounded above by this. That's little. So this time, it's the oscillation that's small. This takes advantage of the fact that uh -huh, the oscillation of F is small. So in the first part, we had big oscillation, but small sets. This time we got little oscillation, but maybe big sets. So looking at this sum here, what we had above from the upper Riemann sum minus the lower Riemann sum, but part of it, the part corresponding to the, these things here, um, how big is the oscillation? It's bounded by this, epsilon over two times B minus A, epsilon over two times B minus A. Now we got a sum of the lengths of the intervals, the little sub intervals. Um, if I take all of those sub intervals, the sums of their lengths gonna be B minus A. Remember the little sub intervals come from partition P of the interval AB. P, is a partition of the interval a b. So when I add up the sums of the all of the little sub intervals from this partition, we get the length of this interval. We get b minus a. Okay. Well, you don't have all of them necessarily. Uh, you got some sub collection of them. All right. So uh, less than uh, b minus a. Then. Less than or equal to, if you like. I've got a strict inequality upstairs to ultimately get my strict inequality. Anyhow, the b minus a is cancel, and we get epsilon over two. Why did we do a, a epsilon over two capital M minus lowercase m? To get a handle on oscillation. Why did we do um, a epsilon over two B minus A thing? To get a handle on, um, there's also a handle on oscillation in this one as well. We use the B minus A here to get the sum of the interval stuff out. We use the capital M lowercase m here to get a, uh, something related to the a bound on the oscillation. So uh, big set, little variation, uh, big variation, but small set. So we balanced the two and that's what analysis is about. You got some wiggle room by the epsilon. The epsilon gave you some wiggle room. We used part of it on the capital I's and the other part of it on these um, delta 
at type intervals. Okay, so if we'll run back up here and take upper Riemann sum minus lower Riemann sum with respect to this partition we have constructed, that's this plus that. This was bounded by epsilon over two, so was that down at the bottom, next screen. We've got the sum, uh, sorry, the difference of uh, upper and lower Riemann sums less than epsilon. That implies Riemann integrability. That was theorem 6.6, 6-6 that gave that. If there's a partition such that upper minus lower Riemann sum can be made less than epsilon for an arbitrary epsilon, then we have Riemann integrability. And there you go. That is the riemann lebesgue theorem. In summary, let f be a bounded function defined on the interval from a to b. f is Riemann integrable on that interval, if and only if the set of discontinuities of f on that interval has measure zero. Awesome. Uh, early on, theorems, I guess, 6.4 and 6.6, .6, we had necessary and sufficient conditions for Riemann integrability, um, but they weren't conditions on the function. They were conditions on the, uh, the existence of partitions and all this other stuff. They were true, but they weren't terribly useful. They didn't tell me anything about properties of the functions. They told me stuff involving the Riemann integral, so nothing direct. This time, the riemann lebesgue theorem cleanly classifies Riemann integrable functions. It gives a condition on the function, and by the way, that condition involves continuity. And it doesn't refer to partitions or Riemann sums or any of that stuff directly. So we can just look at a function and see how continuous it is or how discontinuous it is. Uh, we saw before we got into this that a continuous function is Riemann integrable. And you see that in calculus one. So perhaps it is not surprising that necessary and sufficient conditions for Riemann integrability of F involve the level of discontinuity. So the way I always read this is uh, a function, a bounded function on a closed and bounded interval, is Riemann integrable if and only if it's not too badly discontinuous. I would say that, um, I need, might even bring it up in a calculus one class. I'd push it in a senior level analysis class, in a graduate level analysis class. It's a, almost a passing observation because uh, we got bigger fish to fry in the graduate analysis class. But think of it in terms of continuity. It, it fits in with some stuff you saw in Calculus 1. Um, you couldn't talk about this stuff in Calculus 1, and you may not have talked about this stuff in senior level analysis, another reason I prepared this supplemental stuff. But we can talk about measure zero without too much trouble. Uh, measure theory, that's a whole nother ball game. But measure zero, in some sense, nothing goes wrong. Uh, with measure zero sets. Yeah, you can't do very much if you stick with measure zero sets either. Well, one thing you can do is a riemann lebesgue theorem. A quickie little historical comment. And who brings you the, the kind of integration you see in calculus one? Well, it's Riemann. It's called Riemann integration. Lebesgue brings you measure theory. So what's the history behind this? Riemann, when I say Riemann, I'm implying 1850s. So Riemann does his work around 1850. Uh, Lebesgue does his work, uh, I think it's 1906. Lebesgue's PhD dissertation was creation of Lebesgue measure and Lebesgue integration. So there's a oh, half a century between these two folks. Why is it called a Riemann-Lebesgue theorem? Did, did Riemann know this? Well, Riemann knew this, but he wouldn't say it like that. Lebesgue knew this, Lebesgue would say it like, like that in terms of measure because Lebesgue introduces measure. There's, he didn't do it in a vacuum. There were some ideas predating Lebesgue, some other ideas rattling around in the, the late 19th century. Um, but Riemann knew this result. He just wouldn't describe it in terms of measure. He'd describe it in terms of discontinuities and, um, and, and coverings. He'd describe it somehow or other in terms of F sigma sets, also terminology Riemann wouldn't use, but Riemann knew this result. So it's called the Riemann-Lebesgue theorem because it involves Riemann integration and it refers to measure, measure zero at least, and that's why Lebesgue gets tacked on here. But if anybody's responsible for this, it's, it's really Riemann. We've done it in a more modern terminology than Riemann would use. But at the background on it, 
let's look at some specific functions. I think the most exotic function you encountered in your undergraduate analysis class might be the following. Let's take f of x to be zero if x is irrational and one over q if x equals p over q in reduced form. Uh, and the input value is rational. So we're getting zero out on the irrationals and we're getting one over q out um, at rational numbers of the form p over q. So um, at uh, one third, if x equals one third, we get out one third. If x equals two thirds, two over three, we get out one third. Uh, at all the thirds, we get out one third. At seven thirds, we get out one third. At eight thirds, we get out one third. At nine thirds, well, nine thirds is three in lowest form, so we get out, we get out three. Uh, no, sorry, I guess we get out uh, three over one. I guess we get out one um, at all integer values. Uh, at, um, as the denominator gets bigger, the function value gets smaller. And I'd suspect you saw this in a senior level analysis class. It's a classical or standard example. Um, it's straightforward, I say down here, to show that f is continuous on the rationals and discontinuous on, sorry, continuous on the irrationals and discontinuous on the rationals. You give me a rational number, I can epsilon delta my way through it and show continuity. You give me a, a rational number and I can epsilon delta my way through and show discontinuity. I hope all those words came out correctly. It's continuous on the irrationals and discontinuous on the rationals. Um, so the set of discontinuities involves only rational numbers. Rational numbers form a countable set, big result from cardinality, from senior level analysis. Uh, countable sets have measure zero. So the set of discontinuities of this function has measure zero. So this function is Riemann integrable. Uh, I bet it's Riemann integral is zero because it's, I don't know, it's usually zero. Uh, to prove the Riemann integral is zero, uh, we'd have to go through the very definition of Riemann integral. Uh, if we Riemann integrate over the whole real line, you know, I snuck in a new little notation here, what the hell, of an integral over the whole real line, an integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of x dx is, is what this shorthand stands for here. Um, sort of uh, foreshadowing some notation we'll use in the setting of Lebesgue integration. But this function has an integral of zero over any appropriate set. Uh, it is Riemann integrable because the set of discontinuities has measure zero. And it's an infinite set. I mean, it's it's in cardinality, it's pretty badly discontinuous. Uh, here we go. It's discontinuous on the rationals. So I reach into the real number line and grab a handful of points and pull them out. There's an infinite number of points in there at which this function is discontinuous. Yeah, but it's a countably infinite number and the function is discontinuous on a set of measure zero. It's a measure theory thing, not a cardinality thing. Uh, here's another function. Um, if you really dig into that calculus book, you'll find a mention of the Dirichlet function in question 137 uh, in the section where you first define Riemann integration probably. It's, it's buried in the really high numbered exercises is my point. Um, and certainly you saw this in senior level analysis. Uh, the Dirichlet function defined to be uh, zero on the irrationals and one on the rationals. Sometimes it's defined a different way. Re uh, interchanging the roles of rationals and irrationals is a useful thing to do in certain settings, but we'll take this as the Dirichlet function. Historically, this is it. Uh, this function's bounded. Uh, it, it's bounded above by one and below by zero. Uh, it only takes on the values zero and one, but it's dis discontinuous everywhere. It's discontinuous, um, say on the point Oh, sorry, on the interval zero to one, so I can talk Riemann integration, or at least try. On the interval zero to one, uh, that function is discontinuous everywhere. What's the measure of the interval zero to one? Well, the measure of an open interval was its length. 
The measure of a closed interval is its length as well. Now I'm a little out of my element with the background we have now. That technically we can't show that, but it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Um, we know right now nothing about positive measure sets other than uh, the measure of an open interval is its length. Closed intervals, we don't know the measures or their lengths, but they are. And that shouldn't be surprising. Uh, but I do have to uh, make a claim on authority instead of uh, arguing it. We'll go through and prove this in real analysis, graduate real analysis. Um, but technically, we can't really prove anything about closed intervals. We don't know enough about measure theory. We will. And we will see then that the measure of the interval 0, 1 is 1. So the set of discontinuities has measure 1, not measure 0. All right, then that's not a Riemann integrable function. So says the riemann lebesgue function. Yeah, you can go through and look at a upper Riemann sum and a lower Riemann sum for a given partition. The lower Riemann sum is always zero. The upper Riemann sum is always one, no matter what the partition is. And from that, you can conclude. And this is how you would conclude in calculus one uh, that and, and in senior level analysis until you do the riemann lebesgue theorem. This is not Riemann integrable. So it's not based on the riemann lebesgue theorem, and it's not based on some things that precede that some things that are uh, maybe more elementary. riemann lebesgue theorem is not that complicated it, if you have a feel for measure theory, but that's what you're here for. Uh, so not Riemann integrable um, by definition of Riemann integral or by the riemann lebesgue theorem. So there's functions out there that can't be Riemann integrated. So we take this as motivation to study another type of function. Um, this function is so easy to integrate with respect to Lebesgue integration. Uh, this function is almost like a constant function from the perspective of a Lebesgue integral. Uh, it'll be called a characteristic function. Um, but there's a function that's not Riemann integrable and by analysis standards, it's not that exotic. Uh, it's probably even in your calculus one book. Um, so if we want to integrate more functions, we need something more robust than Riemann integration. So the intent of this extra stuff here, the supplement is why bother with something beyond Riemann integration? Well, uh, first off, there's functions that can't be Riemann integrated. There's one right there. So there's one part of the motivation. And here's another part. In applied math, mm, I hesitate to motivate new mathematical topics by resorting to applications. Yeah, I'm a pure math guy. I got nothing against applications, um, but I'm about to make a motivation. It's, sort of related to applications. Um, and you've seen this, even in calculus too, you see this. Uh, suppose you're trying to perform some mathematical technique like integrating. Integration's hard. Differentiation's a piece of cake. Integration's hard. I can make up functions you can't integrate. I lie, sort of. You can integrate, um, how about e to the negative x squared? e to the negative x squared power, the exponentiation of negative x squared. You don't know how to integrate that. Why would you want to? Well, that's the bell curve, the normal distribution, um, minus some constants, but it's the normal distribution. So all the values in a C table come from integrating e to the negative x squared with some decoration. Uh, well, where do numbers in the Z table come from? Or from your calculator. Uh, they take that exponential function, write it as a series, plug in negative x squared, and integrate the series. So there's reasons to want to take a function and replace it, say, with a power series. Power series are easy to integrate. E to the negative x squared, there's no way to integrate that other than writing it as a power series. The applied math folks would say there's not a closed form way to write the integral of e to the negative x squared. That is, it requires series. So maybe taking uh, motivation from, from applied math or integration 
It's common to take a function and replace it with a, a limit of some sequence. Uh, be a sequence of partial sums if I've replaced it with a power series. And then I might be interested in, it's worded here in terms of sequences, but remember power series are limits of sequences. It's the limit of the sequence of partial sums. So if f uh, f of x equals, the limit is n approaches infinity of f sub n of x. In other words, this function is for all x on this interval, the limit of this sequence of functions. One reason the prerequisite for graduate real analysis, one is senior level analysis, two is it's part two where you do the integration and it's part two where you deal with sequences of functions. So we got a sequence of functions f sub n that converges to this function f. When is it? Uh, we require certain conditions. You know, when is it that I can say the integral of the limit is the limit of the integrals? When can you bring that limit outside of that integral? Well, if it's a Riemann integral, you did this in senior level analysis, probably part two. Uh, this may have come up, it probably, it's been a while since I've done calculus two. It's probably somewhere in calculus two as well, maybe. But if it might be somewhat glossed over. Um, the certain conditions that allow us to take limits of a sequence like that in and, so, in and out of an integral, let's look at it again. Take this limit outside of the integral to get that or take the limit inside of the integral to get this. Taking that limit in and out of that integral, conditions that allow you to do that are called convergence theorems. And we will have three or four convergence theorems. Uh, this will come once we've established Lebesgue measure and then we've uh, gone on to establish Lebesgue integration. Uh, we'll have a convergence theorem at each level. We'll build Lebesgue integration up in levels. But we'll have uh, several convergence theorems and we will be uh, much more capable of passing limits in and out of integrals, which are Lebesgue integrals, than other folks are if they're stuck with Riemann integrals. In fact, this is dealt with in senior level analysis uh, in terms of uniform convergence. The punchline is, we go through the definition of uniform convergence, the punchline is if I have a sequence of functions, a uh, sequence of Riemann integrable functions, and that sequence converges uniformly to function f on the interval from a to b, then uh, the limit function is Riemann integrable on a, b, and the limit of the integrals is the integral of the limits. When can you take limits in and out of a Riemann integral? When that sequence of functions converges uniformly to the limit function. And uniform convergence is a fairly restrictive form of convergence. Uh, for the record, this is a definition. Let f sub n be a sequence of functions defined on a set E, a subset of the reals. And suppose f of x is a limit as n approaches infinity of f sub n of x for every x in E. Uh, this is sometimes called a pointwise limit. There's other ways to measure limits. Uh, but we've got a pointwise convergence for every x value in set E of the sequence of functions to the limit function f. That sequence is said to converge uniformly to f if for, e for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N such that if the index is strictly greater than capital N, then the absolute value of f sub n of x minus f of x is less than epsilon. And this holds for every x in set E. That's the uniform part. Uh, what it means is, as you explored in your senior level analysis class, the choice of uh, how far out to go in the sequence, the choice of the capital N depends only on the epsilon. It doesn't depend on the X value. And it's easy enough to come up with examples of sequences of functions that converge pointwise, but don't converge uniformly not hard at all. So, um, dealing with uniform convergence, having a requirement of uniform convergence is a fairly restrictive condition to have. 
Uh, so in a sense, Riemann integration is, uh, it's kind of weak when it comes to this convergence theorem type thing. That's all you got there is theorem A3 in terms of convergence in Riemann integration. So that gives us a second motivation to look at another type of integration to get a stronger theory of integration, really one that gives you more convergence theories. So in conclusion, to summarize, we got two motivations to explore a new type of integration. One is to integrate a broader class of functions, maybe functions that are more discontinuous than just set of discontinuities having measure zero, to do some things that Riemann can't. And Lebesgue integration accomplishes that. And secondly, to have uh, really more convergence theorems. Uh, more types of theorems there I can take limits inside an integral. Because integration is so hard, I want to replace function f with a sequence of nice functions. And function f, now I may have no clue what function f, how to integrate it, like e to the negative x squared. But if I write it as a series, I'm good at integrating series. Series are kind of like giant polynomials. They're powers of x with coefficients. Uh, add one to the exponent and divide. Done. So we want more of this kind of thing where we have more convergence theorems, where we can replace a, a difficult function with a, some, a sequence of cooperative functions, like replacing an exponential function with a negative x squared in it with a bunch of polynomials, approximations, and then some limits going on. That's why you take Lebesgue integration in graduate school. Uh, first, we'll have to do Lebesgue measure and get some measure theory on the board. Once we have that up and running, then we're ready to tackle the Lebesgue integration. Real analysis one covers Lebesgue measure, Lebesgue integration, and a few properties of Lebesgue integration. Uh, part two, we'll, uh, we'll take it from there and look at some more exotic um, function spaces and more abstract integration. But that's why you're taking real analysis one. Uh, the measure theory stuff will have applications to probability theory. Probability theory is actually a branch of uh, measure theory, modern probability theory is. So have a nice day. I'll see you in uh, the Royden book. We'll start looking at them F sigma and G delta sets first thing uh, in that material. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.